Good day, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you're watching this. I've got a special guest here today, a friend of mine, Matthew, P is it Pleasy or Please? How do we say it? Pleasy. Pleasy. See, I, we're, we're internet friends. You know how you make friends mm -hmm. in the modern age. We've written back and forth. We were both uh, contributors at the Fatima Center. He still is. I was there for a couple of years. We are both contributors at 1 Peter 5. Um, and we're going to talk about his book that was put out at the end of last year on the Roman Catechism, which is a very important issue with all our doctrinal confusion. Uh, first, I just want to read uh, quickly from his biography here. Matthew Pleasy is a third-order Dominican who resides in Chicago, Illinois. Matthew is a practicing certified public accountant and catechist. Uh, that actually, as a side note, that those kind of work well together. You've got to be very good with the details as an accountant and a catechist, so that's perfect. Uh, he is the president of catechismclass.com, an online-based organization whose mission is to make the best in Catholic religious education and sacramental preparation available for those who need it. That's awesome. Matthew writes a monthly piece on apologetics and catechetics for Catholic Family News. That's another place we both write for. I forgot that. And a weekly column for the Fatima Center. He is also the author of Catholic Book Summaries, 54 Traditional and Contemporary Classics, Eschatology, the Catholic Study of the Four Last Things, uh, understanding the precepts of the church uh, and the Roman catechism explained for the modern world, as well as the definitive guide to Catholic fasting and abstinence. He also blogs at Catholic, a Catholic life. Matthew, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kennedy. That was a long biography. Thanks for getting, getting through all of that. Yeah. Well, you don't sleep very much. I can see from all the time you spend doing work. Yeah. You know, I realized that the other day, you know, I, yeah, that's one thing I, I don't have to give up for Lent. I, I give up sleep pretty regularly throughout the year. Oh, yeah. I think I was in bed for five hours last night or something. Mm. Yeah. Just there's always something to do. And, you know, when you're young and relatively young and healthy, you want to do it all. So that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about, and I'm going to bring it up on the screen here. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you show us the book uh, before I uh, do the share screen? Yep, the thing. Roman Catechism Explained for the Modern World. This is, this is what it looks like. All right, I'm going to bring this up here from Amazon so we can actually see it. And um, as you can see here, this is the Roman Catechism Explained for the Modern World. It was put out, officially published in November. through. Uh, you did it through Our Lady of uh, Victory, correct, with Tim? Flanders? I did, yeah. So yes, yes, thank you to Our Lady of Victory Press for for going through the time to make this happen. It was probably about a year in the the planning and the review and the logistics. Yes. So thanks, yes. thanks really to him and to MeaningOfCatholic.com for for doing that. Yeah, Tim's a great. Tim's uh, wonderful, and he helped me with my first actually my first two books. Um, okay, so here's the description. It says, unbeknownst to many, the new Catechism published in 1992. Uh, also known as the John Paul II Catechism, is far from the only catechism. St. Peter Canisius wrote the first catechism in 1555. Less than a decade later, in 1562, the Roman Catechism was commissioned by the Fathers of the Council of Trent, who saw the need for an authoritative explanation of the faith for the universal church. Prepared under St. Charles Borromeo's supervision and issued by Pope St. Pius V in 1566, it remains the most authoritative catechism in print. For modern readers, however, the Roman Catechism is rather verbose and hard to read. To remedy this, over 100 years ago, Father Francis Spirago authored the Catechism Explained. Now, a century later, Mr. Matthew Plessy has done the same for our day. Uh, wonderful. All right. So why don't you tell us, basic overview. So this book is not, it's not a catechism. So um, is it just pieces of the catechism with commentary? Is it the whole thing in there or is it just sort of selections? How's the book set up? Yes. So that's a great question. So I'd like to start by thanking Catholic family news because they were really the, the whole reason this, this pro this process started. So Mac Aspers from Catholic family news asked me to write a series of articles monthly going through chapter by chapter, the Roman catechism. So that's where it started. So it started back, uh, I believe in 2019 when I did chapter one of the Roman Catechism, and every month was a different chapter. So the book is a compilation of every single one of those articles, because you might not have Catholic Family News from March 2019. You might not, not have all of those editions. And it was so much work that went into it, we wanted it to live on. So this book is those articles put together and bound for perpetuity. What it is, is I do quote heavily the Roman Catechism, but as you noted, it is not a catechism. This is an explanation of the catechism, same as Father Spirago did, where he took the Roman Catechism and he explained it in the words and explained it for the problems of his day a hundred years ago. 
I've sought to do the same. How do we apply the perennial teachings of the Roman Catechism, of St. Pius V, and of true dogmatic teaching from the Council of Trent, and of prior dogmatic teachings? How do we apply that to our problems? How do we ensure that our people are adequately catechized how do I make known things that are, that are not taught today? And especially, how do I apply those teachings to errors, issues, and attacks on the faith that Father Sparago did not have and that the Catechism of um, the Council of Trent did not address? For instance, modernism. For instance, the rise of abortion and of artificial contraception or the rise of communism or socialism or secularism, all those isms that we face today that have really come to a forefront over the past couple couple decades, really. This book is meant to take those teachings and apply it so that way we have that wisdom. And it's also meant to take the teachings and the, the spirituality of the traditional Latin mass and apply that as well. So, for instance, the the end of the Roman Catechism goes over the Our Father in detail, and I talk about how the spirituality of that is seen in the Mass and how the priest prays the Our Father. So I draw from a number of different sources, not just the Baltimore Catechism, not just the Missal, uh, but the Catechism of St. Pius X and other saintly writings. So it's, so it's all of that together, really. That's excellent. Yeah, I am... Um... I have a book on the Society of St. Pius X uh, defending Lefebvre and the SSPX uh, coming out, God willing, by the end of the month, although God's will seems to be the month after. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> um, we're close, but it's just, uh, yeah, full-time job, kids, wife, things, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, but we're close. We're very close to getting it done. People are very anxious for that. But similar to you, I had written so many articles on the SSPX uh, for lots of people. And mm -hmm. I just sort of went through that catalog, you know, with all the mm -hmm. hubbub about the society online, people are asking me, do videos here, do videos there. And I thought, okay, I could, but you know, you kind of forget about videos two weeks later. Um, right. Same so thing with fine. articles. You forget about <clears throat> yes. them. So I thought, you know what, as the old expression is, talk is cheap, you know, so I'll write it down. But <laughs> I've had 40 or 50 pages already written that I've sort mm -hmm. of pieced together as part of the 200 and something. So I understand that process. Okay. One thing that I wanted to ask, so um, the, 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 the Catechism of St. Peter Canisius is seen as sort of the first catechism. Right. What about the Didache? Where, where does that fall into it, back from the, the time of the Apostles of the first century? Yeah, um, so a couple of things with that. Some, some would say that that did form a basis of a catechism, but in the same respect, you could say that some of the canons of Nicaea or some of the other ecumenical councils as well did the same sort of purpose as a compilation of different beliefs and, and, different, and different teachings. Now, early on, the church was, was not uh, one to write down absolutely everything she did. For instance, in my book on fasting, I have a whole section on the Eucharistic fast, and you can trace different pronouncements and decrees on that. We know it was done in the early church, uh, but our records of it being practiced really only go back to the late 100s, when in fact it's believed to have started even beforehand. So there wasn't always something written down. Now, the purpose, though, of a catechism, as we talk about with the Kinesias or with others, was really to take people and sit them down and catechize them. And that's going to be a little bit different than, than the Didache was done or, or others as well. So St. Peter Canisius, his whole reason for writing it down was to combat the rise of Protestantism in Germany. So that was the reason he did that. And then subsequently after him, we have the Roman Catechism. It should also be mentioned that catechisms in and of themselves are not infallible. That's yes. why you can you can critique a lot of the things, the changes being put into the 1992 Catechism. I talk about... And Mac Aspers talks about this in the preface of the book, problems with that catechism, not just in terms of its language. In fact, that it references things from Vatican II that have no dogmatic authority as well. Mm -hmm. uh, even the changes in the death penalty that have recently come about. So we can criticize those. That is not an infallible teaching. Yeah. One of the great tools of the Roman catechism, also known as the Catechism of the Council of Trent, is that if you look at the footnotes, it is heavily quoting from truly dogmatic authoritative teachings, like, for instance, the dogmatic decrees of the Council of Trent and of other councils that came beforehand. So mm -hmm. another thing is not all catechisms are created equal, something important that maybe some people don't think about. They think a catechism is a catechism. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it contains absolutely everything we believe. Of course, mm -hmm. it's not a compilation of our entire history. So there's a whole, for, a, a whole reason why you would use a variety of catechisms. That's, for instance, why catechismclass.com, which, which I oversee, it does such an emphasis on 
for programs, especially for adults, using a blend of different catechisms because it might not click with you when you read the Baltimore Catechism or St. Pius the uh, Tenth Catechism or the Roman Catechism, but one of them might. That's why a blended approach, I feel like, is always pretty good as well. So just because you have another catechism on your shelf, you've read a catechism, just because you've read the Catechism of the Council of Trent doesn't mean that this book would not be of a great aid to you or to your RCIA classes or to your family. There's definitely a practical purpose to it. Yeah, you mentioned your website, catechismclass.com. We have that showing here. Um, <clears throat> I remember hearing you talk about this with Tim a couple of years ago on his show. Mm -hmm. um, is this, so, I mean, I know this website's amazing. I've looked through it and I thought, wow, this is amazing. Is this used by any official organs within the diocese or anything like that? Or is it mainly just for personal use and maybe homeschooling or something? Um, so we were, we were created back in 2004 priest actually, um, pretty early on really in the internet age, I would say he wanted to transmit the fullness of doctrine. He was a diocesan priest from Pennsylvania to transmit the fullness of doctrine using new media. And thus he looked at the internet. He started it as a way to really, um, bring together homeschooling families. That was the mm -hmm. original model. Um, I came on in 2007. I really took over with him in 2010. Since then, we do a number of different adult courses on all different aspects of the faith. We have catechumens take our class. We have people who just want to learn more. We have bundles so you can get uh, those different courses at a discount. And every and sacramental prep too. Godparent classes are, are very popular with us. Marriage preparation as well. So um, it is a lot of families, but we thankfully have dozens of different parishes all around the country uh, use our program, especially oh, God parent classes, marriage. We have FSSP uh, parishes use us. We have regular diocesan classes who just see the, the great value in having um, online education, especially, unfortunately, you know, we've seen in the pandemic, a lot of people went online because places were closed, even parishes were closed. So if you can't go to mass and you can't go online for religious ed, parents are also taking uh, the, the, you know, taking the, the lead on that and, and catechizing their children. So we do have a number of parishes. I even do have a number of um, diocesan directors of religious education throughout uh, the United States, at least, who are traditionally minded, who probably don't want their names known, uh, but very traditionally minded, who yeah, recommended... They'll be, they, they'll be out of a job if they let you know. <laughs> exactly. But no, it, it, we do have a lot of people at all different... Uh, levels use it because I really do view that as part of my Dominican spirituality of how do I catechize and make available the faith in a true age of doctrinal crisis. And that's something I take seriously. You're a third order Dominican, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm a third order uh, in the society of St. Pius 10th. So okay. Different, different one. Um, but uh, yes, the demands and stuff, and you've got some responsibilities. I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's an amazing website. Uh, you know, we homeschool our children, um, and there's still super little. I mean, I mean, my oldest is, uh, great. Is he grade two? He's grade two. He just did his first communion last year. Uh, oh, wonderful. So we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty, but that's an amazing website. Uh, you know, and if you're somebody out there, you know, sometimes I'll get emails from people who are basically just trying to get into the church and convert, but they are told to go through the, uh, RCIA process. Mm -hmm. And it's sadly in some places kind of scandalizing. In I'm many gonna, places. That's one yeah. of the reasons I made my own RCIA in 2010, that thankfully a number of parishes use or, or will accept in lieu of their classes. Oh, they'll accept they, it. Oh, okay, uh, quite, quite, a, quite a bit. Of course, not, not 100%, of course, but I mean, I do know hundreds of people who take it every year. Uh, okay, and I'm I love that, that from now on. For yeah, people. because I, my emphasis is I want you to understand what it means to believe as a Catholic and to live as a Catholic. So that's why there's intellectual formation. Mm -hmm. And there's also emphasis in every lesson. How do you live it out? You know, pray the rosary, do the spiritual works of mercy, prayers to memorize. Well, you know, obviously fasting and absence. Like, what are the practices you do? And what does the church really definitively teach? And some places don't like to go over those details. Why are they afraid of offending people? They might even not know. For instance, one of the things that's I right. talk about in the Roman Catechism Explained for the Modern World that, that I also wrote an article online for the Fatima Center about some years ago was how the worst of all mortal sins is idolatry. It's not okay. murder. It's not, not, not running, you know, um, mass concentration camps. You would think of those, you know, think of like the worst possible crimes. No, it's idolatry. 
It's dropping a single grain of incense before a wooden idol and adoring a statue as if that was the God of the universe. That, as the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia talks about, is the worst of all mortal sins. And I talk about that in here in, in terms of the first commandment. And I feel like people maybe are afraid of offending people or people who are even generally, you know, good hearted people just don't know the faith as well, because it does take an immense amount of study, I thankfully I take that responsibility as a Dominican to study every day the faith and to pass on what, what I learned, the fruit of that contemplation. And that's something I've never heard talked about in an RCA class, but no. it's an aspect of our faith, too. I mean, there's a lot of doctrines that aren't talked about. I mean, you know, um, was speaking with a, someone I know was speaking with a well-meaning, very conservative Catholic family. Not traditional, but, you know, they've, they're definitely not uh, only Sunday Catholics and, <clears throat> you know, we brought up the idea of outside the church, no salvation. Mm-hmm. And they, and this, this is a family that homeschooled, you know, all these kinds of things. And they were kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess that's a doctrine. And it's like, that's the whole point of the doctrines. Yeah. You know, I mean, without that one, what's the point of doing any of it? I mean, you know, it's a privilege. Exactly. I mean, just, but this, again, this is a good, this is a very conservative Catholic family, pro-life, mm-hmm. open to life, you know. Praise the rosary, but there's just an aspect there that's missing. Yeah, there is, and there were three dogmatic definitions underscoring that doctrine of no salvation outside the church. Went back to Pope Eugene the Fourth, actually. So, and I mean that that is not some random one-off uh, theological opinion. Even that was dogmatically defined multiple yeah. times. Oh yeah. Uh, what's what's the weight of this? Maybe is an off-topic question. The Athanasian Creed intrigues me. I know that it's. Uh, I don't think it's actually written by Athanasius. But it's no, I don't. I believe attributed it's attributed to his mindset. Correct. I guess. Mm-hmm. What weight does that have? I mean, is that is that uh, one of the creeds that we're meant to believe, or is it sort of almost optional? How does that one work? I would not say it's optional at all, because like the Nicene Creed or like the Apostles' Creed, it's, play, it's prayed liturgically. Mm. So to say that there was something wrong with it right. uh, would say that the Church really incorporates in her active worship air and i don't think somebody could make that claim for instance this was before the the changes really to the breviary in 1960 was prayed much more often i don't know yeah. if you're aware of those changes but really if you look at the 1962 uh breviary it's only prayed really in trinity sunday where beforehand mm-hmm. it would be prayed much more often it's really a great uh creed to pray we do pray that at catechismclass.com in a couple of different lessons but yeah if somebody's listening and you've never heard that read that one. and you would be surprised like oh the church really believes and authoritatively teaches this um it's it's something to, to read for sure and pray. it's very hardcore i mean it's it's very clear if you deny the trinity you're lost forever and it says it three or four times in there like it's explicit you know it's not mm-hmm. even it's a double down you know it's like yeah. it's like it's tripled down yeah yeah i agree i brought that up one time to someone um and they weren't very happy. They said, well, this is one of those old things, you know, and again, this is another conservative Catholic, you know, sort of annoyed that I was so insistent on, insistent on this idea of outside the church, no salvation. And, and, uh, I'm like, listen, this isn't just some rad trad opinion. This is, this is it, you know, this yeah. is, this is the church. I mean, there's no, it's not an opinion at all. It's just, it yeah. just exists. <laughs> Yeah, if, if it wasn't the case, the missionaries are for naught. Like, why risk yes. your life? Why why would you ever be a missionary? Why would you go to foreign land? Why would you be martyred? Why do we why do we bother explaining the faith even to children? You know, if you can be saved in any religion, this is not a cultural club. We're not yeah. doing this because we're a part of certain nation or or our heritage or anything. Is our it's it's the faith. It's the only way to get to heaven. You know, uh, aside from this name, there's no other name under heaven by which men are saved. And Christ has to have only one church because he's only one Christ. He can't be the head of two conflicting bodies with different doctrine at the same time. So it makes sense that there can only be at maximum one true religion in the world. And that is the Catholic religion. I talk about in a in the book, too, a little bit here, as well as my current articles on um, Catholic Family News. And, and of course, I actually wrote on, on the topic of miracles as well at catechismclass.com. We talk about that. Miracles for the Catholic faith, not for other religions, are just so overwhelmingly abundant. God just continues yeah. to shower us with such proofs. Scientifically, you know, I mean, if you look at those and we look at it in that respect, it's really amazing. So you can say it's not true. And if it is true, you have to believe all of it, which necessitates no salvation outside the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so we don't say catechisms are infallible, and that makes sense in so far as you know. I was um, in putting this book together. I was doing some research into uh, the Second Vatican Council, <clears throat> and 
You know, it's funny. The critics of tradition in general, but especially of the SSPX, will make it seem like, you know, they quote-unquote reject Vatican II. Um, but it's never actually been the dance of the church. You know, when you actually look at the negotiations between Rome and the SSPX, it's never been an accusation in an official sense, in like protocol or something like that, where, you know, you must accept all of Vatican II. Um, and there's a reason for that. Because I was reading this... Um, this, this paper from a, a priest called Is Vatican II Infallible? And he went back to the writings of Bellarmine and I think Cajetan talking about the Council of Trent and saying, listen, it's very clear in an ecumenical council, if it's anathematized, there's an infallibility attached. But even there, there must be a sort of, Dr. John Joy might call it a narrow understanding because you don't want to insert something that's not supposed to be there. If something doesn't exist at that time, for example, you can't say, well, you can't necessarily stretch it. Not that we're trying to be, uh, we're not trying to downplay, but just to be fair is the point. Mm -hmm. um, and if something's clearly defined. So if you look at the second, and, that, and then he said, the, the authors go on to say, even in Trent, which of course he would say is one of the greatest councils you could ever have. Um, even there, it's, they're saying in the 1600s, the explanations that are part of the documents from the, from the Council of Trent those explanations don't necessarily carry the weight of infallibility. And they're saying this about Trent. So yes, transubstantiation, must believe that. Uh -huh. A theologian's explanation of it, we can debate, but we have to believe that it's an actual dogma. So of course, when we look at the Second Vatican Council, no new dogmas defined, no anathemas attached, the nota previa saying, you know, that uh, we didn't invoke infallibility and so on and so forth. I mean, we can't even say that, you know, you can... Uh, this idea of rejecting Vatican II is a very vague concept because it's not clear what we are required to accept and what we're required not. So how does a catechism, especially the Roman catechism, help us, even though it's not infallible, sort of cut through that fog and know what we need to know? So this is something that some people ask me. They ask me, why do I state in the book, as well as I think it might even be on the cover or, or it's definitely in the description, why this is the most authoritative catechism ever printed? And I say not the most authoritative at the time, but still the most authoritative Ever. one ever printed. And I do that for a few reasons, one of which it was called for by an ecumenical council, an actual right. ecumenical council. Two, it was authored under the supervision of St. Charles Borromeo. So we have a saint overseeing it, whereas we have some great catechisms that, that a lot of people don't know about. For instance, um, the Dewey Catechism, we have the Bishop Hayes Catechism. Father Patrick Powers' catechism, Cardinal Gibbons wrote a catechism. All those are good. I use those Butlers. in different I like situations. Butlers. I like the Butler one. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. see, there's a lot, though, yeah. that people don't even know about. Uh, but none of those were, were made by saints. So this was right. also called the catechism of, some people call it the catechism of St. Charles Borromeo, too. So it's really right. a catechism of a lot of different names. So it definitely has an authority for that reason as well. And the other thing is, if you look at the actual items in there, it is heavily quoting and including dogmatic pronouncements. It's a great right. compilation that time. It's not just opinions and, and conjecture. It's, it's really based in that. So for that reason, that's why I say it's so authoritative. That's why I say it's really the gold standard. And it really has. Um, so when we put this book out, we are really happy to get Bishop Athanasius Snyder's endorsement of it. Mm. And uh, he said... Um, a, a very short little um, endorsement line. He said, quote, the Roman catechism has been a trusted source of Catholic doctrine for centuries. Mr. Pleasy has done a great service in transmitting this classic catechism for the modern world. That's what he said. But he emphasized it's been a trusted source of Catholic doctrine for centuries, not 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 for the period after, you know, the, the council, even when these other catechisms were coming out, it was still very much an authoritative catechism. And in fact, in the preface that I had Mac Asper's write, he mentioned how St. Pius X instructs parish priests to give uh, catechesis and lectures and sermons based on that catechism, not right. on his catechism that St. Pius X wrote, not, not, not anything else, but that particular catechism from the Council mm -hmm. of Trent. So even hundreds of years later, he's calling for people to keep it. Yeah, it's definitely indispensable. So we see the rise of the sort of official catechisms in the 1500s. Before that, obviously, people were catechized. Mm -hmm. So um, I've always wondered, you know, is it, is it a, I think I know the answer to this, but maybe, the, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the audience doesn't know. Um, am I wrong in assuming it's sort of a general principle of the church that if something is an ancient tradition or something is accepted as dogma, essentially, as far as we can tell, 
that that sort of thing must be accepted as actually dogmatic. So, I mean, by the time you get to these 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 catechisms uh, 1,500 years into the church, it's not as if they're just writing down these dogmas for the first time. It's just that they're sort of compiling what's always been believed in one volume for the first time. Is that sort of how to explain it? Correct. Um, so this reminds me, there was a document put out some time ago, and um, I actually I use it in, in my catechism lessons. And it's a it's a document that goes over, it says the 255 infallibly declared dogmas of the Catholic faith. So I, I include that in some of our, actually our RCIA lessons and lessons for adults. So I think it's important to understand just even to read through, here's what we dogmatically believe. But what's interesting, what you just reminded me, was there's a section at the bottom that says the 102 certain truths not yet defined by the magisterium. So that really kind of goes to what you just said. Um, and, and there's great things really in there. Um, like for instance, Mary being the mother of God is entitled to the call of hyperdulia is one of those 102. Mm. I don't think any, any really committed Catholic would ever, would ever doubt that. Yeah. Or, or for instance, the primary minister of the sacraments is Jesus Christ. That is one of those 102 certain truths that has not been dogmatically defined. So there's things in there. Nobody w- would deny. And it ends in the list with the present world will be destroyed on the last day and the present world will be restored on the last day. So it really goes over all these different things, and no even talks about at the end of the world. So just because something has not been dogmatically defined, you know, I pronounce and declare this to be the case, doesn't mean we're at liberty to, to deny that. So there are things we can debate. You know, mm-hmm. the Franciscans and Dominicans famously debated things. Uh, yeah. And sometimes something would come out, there would be a dogmatic decree. There was, there was debate, you know, famously, um, if uh, the uh, souls in heaven see God then and they enjoy the beatific vision or if they, they have to wait till the end of the world. And that was dogmatically settled. But before it was, there was debate because there was not a certain truth. It was not nothing dogmatically defined. So the church comes to this understanding over time too. And because God is real, we believe that. He continues to teach through his church. He continues to open up those mysteries for us to see that more. That's why, you know, some of the heirs of Protestants that just because something's not in the Bible— you know, they'd say, like, it can't be true. Like, you know, not everything's written in there. God is not suddenly dead on the cross. He rose again. He's alive and he continues to teach and he continues to make known. The apostles couldn't understand the very basic things he was teaching at the time, much less going over to all of these, you know, very minute differences that that it would be to us later in the salvation history to to really uh, work out. So I just think that's uh, is rather interesting. Yeah, that really cuts to the heart of this uh desire during the council to just sort of go back to the scriptures Mm -hmm. and of course that's a good thing in principle i guess but um you know even if you look into the old testament this is one of the examples i use in my book on the society um when we talk about exceptions to laws there are even exceptions to divine positive law in the sense of you know uh, king david eats the bread of the proposition uh, when he's not really supposed to. Now, why mm-hmm. is that? Well, there's an exceptionality there if you read that, you know, and the, the purpose of the sacrifice is to be consumed and, and these sorts of things. Um, now, someone would say, well, does that mean that the scriptures aren't infallible? That's not what it means at all. Even though the scriptures are infallible, uh, it's obviously too cumbersome, even for an inspired human author, to write every possible ec- exception that could come in the course of history. <laughs> you know, right. it's just like, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, the analogies could be endless, you know, they didn't even, you know. So when it comes to the teachings of the church, obviously we know what we need to believe in order to be saved, um, but we can keep opening up that flower. It can keep flowering right. into something that's more beautiful. And that only makes sense. That only makes perfect sense because uh, in the same way that, you know, we might say a, a person grows in holiness, you know, we might say in an analogous way, the body of Christ sort of continues to blossom and the holiness is more made manifest through the teachings and through the beauty of the church. And that just, right. I think that makes perfect sense. And, and um, you know, it's funny when you look into the extremes of sort of the Protestant heresies, it's like you have the, the very dogmatic sola scriptura, but then you have the wacky extensions like the Mormonism because, you know, it's like revelation stopped in the year 33, Nothing ever happened after that, you know, no miracles <laughs> since, you know, the apostles versus, well, there's divine related revelation all the time. And there's, there's your prophet mm-hmm. over there, you know, and this Catholic church, like, like always gives us sort of the, uh, the virtuous middle way through those extremes. 
Right. And God shows it's true because the miracles he provides us. So, I mean, we have reason as well that would show us too. And I go over a lot of reason in, in my articles and in the book. Uh, but miracles too, they're just so powerful that this is God actually at work. And we see it as well in the, in the liturgical year too. So, for instance, the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception, long before they were dogmatically defined, were believed. By, by the faithful. I wrote articles on that before, but the church, you know, decided to institute these feast days at certain times to make them holy days of obligation to, to automatically define them. What's interesting is the, before it was called the Immaculate Conception, the feast day was called the Conception of Our Lady, and it was a holy day of obligation for probably about 150 years before it was dogmatically defined. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. You know what, you're right too, with the debates between Franciscans and the different and was it Franciscans Jesuits or Franciscans and Dominicans Dominicans yeah you know I mean that's one thing I wish I can't stand the state of debate today in the church mm -hmm. um you know on the one hand uh like basically debate is sort of proving the other person is a heretic or something right which is not really you can't really do that because you don't have the authority to do that for one um, but also, um, I don't think, I mean, there's definitely some strong debates back in the day, mm -hmm. but if I look into them, I mean, I find a spirit of real academic vigor, you know, and, yes. and, a des and really a desire to get to the heart of the matter of the truth. And mm -hmm. also, um, when there is a position that is debatable, there's just sort of a live and let live. It's like, yeah, it's totally possible for you to accept that interpretation of that because it hasn't been defined. Whereas today, um, I don't know, it just seems that uh, the whole goal is to basically prove that uh, somebody else is going to hell, and it's just so strange. I don't know. Right. It's and and, we, and beforehand, like the prerequisites, you would say, were we, we, we take for granted, and we accept obviously everything the church dogmatically teaches, and now we want to understand this new thing. So we might have differing opinions on that. Yeah. Nowadays, too many people don't have that. They don't have the understanding of what the church really teaches, or they outright reject it. We might talk about a lot of Jesuits now in that yeah. camp is outright rejecting it. That's not the same as before. For instance, we have on each side saints. We have St. Dominic here. We have St. Francis here. We have St. Bonaventure here. We have St. Thomas Aquinas here. So That's we have true. saints on each side, and they're just coming to an understanding. And it's okay to, to be wrong because we're fallible. You know, we're, we yeah. are not God. So, But we don't, we don't deny something that's dogmatic. So part of, you know, the debates and part of looking at the research, really, unfortunately, in the 1900s, and this was, you know, sometime a little bit before Vatican II, we started to have people throwing that out the window and saying beforehand, this is this is the basis. And now I'm building up on that with this with the scripture commentary and all of this work. And now we're saying, oh, to get rid of it. What yeah. do you think? And that that's a Protestant mindset of, well, I don't I think I want to know what God thinks. I want to know what the truth is. So what's given and now i'll go to understand that so part of that is laying the groundwork for what the faith really teaches and i tell people all the time learning the faith is a lifelong commitment just mm -hmm. because you went to catholic school your whole life just because you know you were raised catholic your whole life, that does not mean you should not be spending time every single week learning intricacies of the faith i do i learn things all the time actually that and i try to share that like just the other day I learned uh, these interesting rubrics regarding if you say mass in front of a relic of the true cross, how you have to genuflect more because the relic of the true cross is the only relic you genuflect in front of. Huh. Um, and there was actually debate, actually, on uh, Dominicans versus others, whether or not uh, you could say you actually worship the cross with Latria. That ah. was some that was an interesting uh, opinion that St. Thomas said yes, because the, the wood of the cross was the means of salvation, and it was literally soaked with Christ's blood. It's okay, indispensably blood connected would, to him. The blood aspect would make a lot of sense because his physical reality is there. Right, and that's just one of those things I've never heard it explained before. I had never even seen that particular research until I, I was going through something the other day, and I ended up writing an article that's going to come out soon on that but that's what i mean like there's just so much out there you can spend your whole life learning this and when you learn these little rubrical things you think that's not important but it yeah. shows you a deep inner spirituality like in the very last chapter of the, of this book i talk about when the priest prays uh the our father um he he is at mass he is instructed unlike all other times and, and you probably have heard this too he's instructed to look at the host mm -hmm. and to speak the words of the our father to the host because although he's holding, you would say he's holding Christ, 
he and the father are one. So the church by doing that wants to show that Christ and the father are one. So he's saying our father while looking at the host. And ever since I learned that actually through the Roman catechism, I, I just, at that moment, I always look at the priest and I see his eyes on the host. And for me, the he and the father are one. It just, I keep coming back to that. That's deeply spiritual, deeply meaningful, made available really through a catechism and nobody ever taught me that before. And I feel like if more people learn that it would add a new dimension to the mass when you see those little things and what they really mean. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, okay. So they can find your book at Amazon. Correct. Is that the best way for them to get it from you? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Our Lady of Victory Press, we're using uh, Amazon KDP to print them. So they're yeah. only printed on Amazon. So that's um it's available in English, uh, in paperback and Kindle. And if you go to the Meaning of Catholic uh, website in Our Lady of Victory uh, Press there, the, the PDF is available for sale on uh, Meaning of Catholic's uh, website. Okay. And uh, have books, I, I know this happened for me when I self-published, have bookstores reached out to you to, to order copies? Uh, not yet. I did reach out to a couple I, okay. I know of. They haven't really gotten back to me yet. Um, hopefully, I, I have approached a few. And if somebody's reading this has a connection and wants to introduce me, I think it would be it would be great because obviously I can get it to them for a discount. So that way they could still sell it for the, the retail price. Same thing with the definitive guide to Catholic fasting and absence. If anybody right. knows somebody who wants this particular book, um, this is available in English, Spanish and Polish. All three Polish. languages and paperback. Yep. Um, my um my book my second book um, lockdown with the devil is in Czech and in Italian. Just came oh. out in Italian. Yeah. Okay. Terror of demons has not been translated yet. I think it's because Tan owns the rights and, but uh, yeah. Well, I was one, I was mentioning the bookstore. <clears throat> excuse me. Mentioning the bookstores because I know uh, Tumblr House. I found out at, uh, a couple of years ago they were selling my book Terror of Demons and they hadn't contacted me and I asked how and he's actually. Uh, registered as a seller through Amazon, he can actually get the copies at 75% of retail. So if you're mm. a bookseller, you can do that. And I recommend, I know there's some people who own stores who watch this show. I recommend uh, you do that. Or if you want your parish to sell it, uh, mm -hmm. maybe they can be, uh, you know, they can be registered as well. And that saves you the, you still get the royalties, but it saves you the headache of having to fulfill the order and stuff, which I know can be. Yes, I did. I did have somebody approach me about the fasting book the other day, um, a friend of mine, a mentor, and he bought 25 copies to send to priests and religious orders to, to get them reading it. So I was happy to do that. But I did have to logistically place the yeah. order and bill them and collect the money and, and deliver thing. it. So yeah, it's much more work. Uh, we need secretaries, don't we? Okay. <laughs> yes, we do. But we yeah, got to be good on details, you know. My, I make a joke here. My, my secretary is too busy homeschooling my kids and taking care of the house. So I take all the terrible to myself. All right, Matt, it's been wonderful. Um, again, people can find your work at a Catholic life, a Catholic life dot blogspot dot com. Is that how it works? Correct. Yes. Yep. Uh, one Peter five, um, Twitter, a Catholic mm -hmm. life. Um, and I have a new podcast place. too. Uh, I just, right. I just, just launched the other day because some people were telling me, You've been writing articles for five, you know, plus years, but not everybody likes reading articles. So why don't you just do a summary in a podcast? So that's what I've done. I've done uh, three episodes now. I just recorded the fourth this morning. It's going to come out on Sunday and God willing every Sunday. So just another avenue to reach people. Uh, to and try that's to get basically catechetical works through, is it called a Catholic Life Podcast? Yes, it is. It's a Catholic like podcast. You can find it on Spotify, Apple, really everything. So, and I, and I do pub, uh, publish it as well on uh, the a Catholic Life website. And for okay. my Patreon members, I do give them early access. So you get two or three days ahead of time um, that's, access that's to awesome. it. Well, that's something to add to your commute. You know, if you're somebody who wants to uh, to read, but you don't have a lot of time, you can kind of do it in conjunction. So, okay, everybody, buy Matthew's books. Um, I guess at this point, we're, by the time this airs, we'll be about a third through Lent. So you can still start fasting. There's no reason to start not start. I mean, you know, fasting for a week is better than not fasting at all. Uh, uh, absolutely. I was telling people all the time, uh, you know, Septuagesima Sunday, the gospel was about the parable of the vineyard and everybody yeah. received the same way. It didn't matter if you showed up at the beginning of the day, mm -hmm. middle of the day, the end of the day. So some people actually were telling me lately, you really go on and on about fasting, but Lent already started. That doesn't matter. You can jump on right now. You know, you don't have yeah. to wait till next year. That's right. So everyone pick up the fasting book. 
uh, and the catechism. And, and, you know, add that to your, put it on your bedside. Just read, you know, four or five pages before you fall asleep. By the end of the year, you've read through a, an explanation of the catechism, and you'll know your faith uh, better than a lot of people, which is great yeah. and good for your soul. And the, right, book, the book, too, on fasting, short, under yes. a little bit under 100 pages. I mean, priests told me 95% of it was new to them. So this is not a, you know, a basic book of, I, I know what fasting is. I mean, this was three, four years of research. The same thing right. too with the Roman Catechism the book. I really try to make known things that not everybody's talking about, because I think the detail is so important to understand yeah. that. So thank you for having me on, Kennedy. It's uh, really nice to be here to be able to talk about the books. Wonderful. And I'll uh, let you know when it's out. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, let me know what you think in the comments. Get a hold of Matthew. This has been the Kennedy Report.